Okay, well, I'm standing here as the chair of the research committee for the British Institute of Persian Studies, which has uh, graciously um, funded the whole event. Andrew obviously has raised some, sub some substantial funds to get this whole thing streamed. So I think we should thank Andrew for his great efforts. <laughs> And on an academic note, I should say that these kind of events are so useful, really so useful. I mean, apart from being able to deliver our own research, we are able to forge new networks, make new friends, and discover new possibilities and new directions for our own research. So hopefully, from, from Bibbs' side, is that we expect something from you in return. Which, of course, in the, in the near future, well, maybe not so near, but in the, in the distant future, maybe, is that we will expect some kind of output. Hopefully, this will be in the form of a book, a, collected, a collection of essays uh, on the theme of Andrew's topic of subaltern voices. Okay, so now is your chance to perhaps polish up your, your presentations. Think about the comments that uh, the audience have made. And um, I'm sure Andrew will be in touch with all, all of you and perhaps give you some provisional deadline for submission of papers. So please don't forget that. Um, so thank you very much. Um, one last thing I'd like to say is, as chair of the research committee is that we have a research budget. Okay, we have a research budget annually. Um, I'm not going to say how much it's worth, but I should say to you, please do consider applying to BIPS. BIPS gives money to those people who have research projects, okay, Please do send us an application. The application forms are online. You can download them, fill them in, and send them to BIPS. We have the next funding round is in, uh, I think, February or March. Okay? We can only give money to those people who have an academic affiliation to a British university. If that does not apply to you, please do let your friends know who may have some kind of affiliation. Okay? Usually we have an underspend. So the chances are, if you have a good application, the chances are you'll get something. Okay, so please do consider sending in a research application to BIPS. Okay? If you want more informal information about this kind of uh, possibility, please do get in contact with either Andrew or myself. Andrew is responsible for, for the modern project, which perhaps may not be applicable for all of you. But if you are specific to the medieval period, then perhaps the first point of call would be me, and then I can hand you on to the appropriate person. Okay? So, Thank you for coming. Nice to meet you all, and I hope to see you all again very, very soon, perhaps next year in the next uh, um, meeting, which could be in, in Manchester, but we'll see how we go. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, on the, on the publication scheme, what we are looking to do, because one of the big things for the, the, the UK, I'm okay here, uh, one of the things for the UK ref is open access publications. And so the idea is that while the audio and visual of this will be mounted, again, via the website, uh, YouTube links and such from the website, uh, the plan is that uh, some of these papers will go up online, having been peer-reviewed first, especially for those people who are therefore in the UK. <clears throat> that does two things. Uh, one, it gets you a publication much more quickly than it would be if you're going through a conventional uh, journal. But at the same time, it ticks that box that I know many British universities are trying to tick, which is open access availability. Uh, and that will increase, generate uh, hits on your kind of work as well as hits on, on the presentation that you will have given, which again, particularly for the ref, is, is something that's quite important. For those people who are not based in the UK, <clears throat> you do not need to know about ref, but, but we hear that this is an issue. And again, open access uh, is, is a thing that all the universities here in the UK are, are valuing. I'd just like to add my thanks both to Sarah and to Andy. And uh, in, for each of you, I have a little card. I'll have to come offline here. <clears throat> Everybody has signed this card. Andy, thank you very much for thanking uh, both of you. Um, but I think all the arrangements, yes, went off without a hitch. The IT so far went off without a hitch and will, will be put up. This is certainly the first of these, to my knowledge, that BIPS has done. Um, so I'm very grateful to both BIPS for doing this, but also to the University of Edinburgh's uh, ERI, Edinburgh Research Institute, for the uh, funds to be able, one, to uh, take on Sarah, um, but also to be able to live stream this and then to do the archiving uh, as well. So I'm very grateful. 
Uh, very grateful to all the participants. It's always nice to come to these things to see a few people who are familiar faces, but I haven't seen them since the last whatever the heck it was, but also to meet some newer people and to find some younger scholars as well who are starting out and a couple, a couple of graduate students as well who have come both from near and from far uh, to encourage them in this, to get them into the networking process and also via the streaming, uh, the live streaming and the archiving to get their work out there and to generate discussions not only on the subalterns level of pre-modern, pre-1501 uh, Iran, but also the particular things in which they are interested. This generates some discourse, some discussions, uh, can lead to possible national but also international research kinds of collaborations and efforts. And again, British universities are quite, uh, I think, quite rightly interested in the internationalization of research. So this is a good way to kind of get your name and your project and your interests uh, out there uh, very, very quickly. And again, once, on you, once this is on YouTube, it's up there and can be accessed uh, again. Uh, I would encourage you, <clears throat> again, in British universities in particular, to monitor that uh, and to see who's you know, having a look-see at this uh, and urge people to get contacts. YouTube, of course, you can do comments and put these things on there and so you can say you know, if anybody's interested in this please get in contact with me at something like this and we can develop these kinds of things. Um, from small uh, seeds, grape trees do uh, occur and certainly the, the history of the field since I first started getting in the field is absolutely unrecognizable in terms of the new sub-disciplines within these kinds of studies that have popped up in the last 10, 15, 20, 30 years which when I was starting out, uh, the age of some of the graduate students were inconceivable at the time. So the field does really uh, grow and is quite dynamic and interesting and, and this is the way to kind of make a mark uh, sooner rather than later. Just to offer one or two reflecting points, um, <clears throat> one of the things that I was asking for when people were sending in abstracts was, was, a, was a bit uh, out of the ordinary, was to talk in their abstracts about the sources they were looking at. Um, to try and reclaim these subaltern voices is quite tricky. We tend to, especially in my area where I'm interested in Hadith studies and the text, you tend to look at that alone and you don't really necessarily consider other things or you have to be argued into seeing that there are, if you will, non-text texts. Okay, non-text texts, things which aren't necessarily the written word. And there was a, a reference, I think, at one point to the, the privileging of the written word as the thing to look at. Whereas, in fact, I think what we've seen throughout the day, uh, today and, and yesterday as well, is that there are written word kinds of resources, but there are also non-written word kind of resources as well to begin to grapple with the question of subalterns and try and recapture these voices. Um, so I'm hoping that in your own work you will continue to think about these things as you work and write and kind of connect with this as one of the aspects of the thing that you are looking at in your own work. It, it gets a chapter or it gets a mention or maybe even shifts quite significantly the, the, the approach that you're using in order to grapple with your stuff and begin to think about the these non, the subaltern groups. In our period, it's very difficult to recapture them. They're illiterate. Uh, we depend on, uh, if we're using text primarily, source materials, court chronicles, religious and other kinds of written words. They're composed by the minority elite. Uh, you have to be careful with that kind of material. You have to, to, to borrow a phrase from the subaltern studies, read against the grain and try and figure out what the context of this kind of material was and what it says or does not say. And we saw a real good range, I think, of written sources used and non-written sources used as well in order to do this kind of thing. <clears throat> the other uh, aspect uh, that I wanted to talk about was again driven home especially by the papers today, and this is the question of identity. Uh, and, and what it would mean to be, if you will, living on the Iranian plateau or living in what we would consider to be the Persianate realm in the pre-1501 period <clears throat> and how you might look at yourself. And uh, it seems to me that this is contested. It's, it's not very clear. And looking from the 20th and the 21st century, uh, wherever we are, we tend to have our own agendas, our own definitions, and we consciously or probably unconsciously, apply them back and we look for Christians or we look for Zoroastrians or we look for Sunnis or Shis or Shafis or whatever it is. Whereas on the ground at the time, these may not even really be issues, okay, and day to day people getting up, <laughs> get the kids to school, and pay your taxes and whatever it was. These aren't the kinds of questions that they will have had in their daily lives. These are our questions as academics, 
but um, these may not have been the questions on the minds of the subalterns, let alone necessarily the rulers themselves, in any given time, in any given place. So again, you're trying to kind of stand back for a minute, understand what your questions are and the milieu of which they are a product, and kind of putting them over to one side and saying, now, can I begin to recapture what was going on at the time? That's complex. It involves being inclusive, not exclusive. It involves saying, I'm going to ask a bigger question or another question rather than just sort of restricting myself to this one. Okay? Sometimes in the immediacy of PhD dissertations or articles or books, you have to do that. But somewhere in there, there might want to be a nod to what I haven't been able to do, which what I'd really like to do in my next project, is kind of do this so that future generations of researchers will keep that in mind as well and perhaps broaden out these kinds of things. And again, especially if we're looking at non-text texts, that's a clue to begin to looking at these kinds of things. There is idealization of subalterns by the elites. Um, but that's a place to start, I think, in many of these sources and using other kinds of sources which are challenging to begin to question those. And if we can't necessarily find out what the subalterns were all about, we can at least capture some ideas of what elites thought subalterns were about as a sort of start to begin to reconstruct what life was like uh, on the ground. But I would suggest life on the ground was much more complex uh, than we would like to or we are able to think about it now, and certainly even on the ground at the time by elites who were busy trying to stay elite <laughs> and everybody else trying to get on with it. And there were tensions. Um, not necessarily of a sectarian nature, as we might like to think of, but the everyday kinds of tensions which we'd like to kind of try to capture. Uh, so beware of using your 21st century um, academic views going back there. Try and put those to one side and say, I'm going to turn this around. And that's what sort of subaltern studies or history from below uh, to use the... Universal, Andrew. I'm sorry? Universal. Yeah, they are universal, but it seems to me if you are aware of them, yeah. then as opposed to being unaware of them, then you bring a slightly so different perspective. Right. Exactly right. Got to know your names and dates, but then. Yeah, that's okay. different yep. from the chronology and then yep. move around. So with that said, uh, again, thank you to all the participants. I would like to see if there's anybody who would like to offer any uh, sort of closing comments. And at that point, then I will sort of uh, wrap up. I want to thank Lloyd for his comments. You've got uh, is that, is it, are they going to be recorded? It's on now. Anybody would like to offer a couple of closing comments? You can, yep, you can. Um, first of all, in terms of the period that you've all been working on, I'm a complete fraud because I work at the far end of Iranian history with the Qajars. <coughs> Qajars, are, but I do move back into the Safavids and I do realize that the Qajars had a very impressive intellectual ancestry in terms of the literature, the <coughs> events, the great epics they were familiar with. But um, I've very much enjoyed the papers. Uh, and I have found certainly with, with Christian and with Derek from Piedmont that their approaches do help me to understand more of what I'm trying to do and I can broaden out. I mean, I love the thought of Yaz being so hot that you could build in mud brick and slap on some plaster. The Kajans didn't do that. They were building with a, they were, it was a bit colder where they were mainly concentrating their buildings. And your approach to these, <clears throat> these literary epics is part of the common history of them. But I also <clears throat> was rather delighted by Suzanne's presentation because her approach is <clears throat> what I've been doing most of my working life as a museum curator. I have worked, I mean, I've, as Andrew says, you get your dates, you get your history, your chronology, but I have worked with the products of the subalterns, some of which are objects of great beauty, the paintings, the fine ceramics, the tile works, the lacquer, but an awful lot is very much basic stuff. And I believe that, and looking at the, my, my, my main sources are the paintings. And, you know, once you've got the ruler enthroned, there's an awful lot going on around him. A lot of people doing things that we need to know about. And to a certain extent, you can support this by textual evidence. 
comments in poetry, prose, <coughs> man and I know, of, I know of manuals of tile making. And so this has been <coughs> a great interest for me, and I'd like to continue to support Andrew, if I can manage the website, but I have every hope. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks very much. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, Christine, well, please. Yeah. So here I come. Um, so what, what I really um, get out of all the presentations we've, uh, we've had these two days is the fact that, as you say, Andrew, these, uh, these voices are, are, are sort of, we, we, we get at them in a negative way, really, uh, sort of the, by, turning, by turning our data and our information you know, the other way around and seeing what is not being said and um, what we can make of that. So we've got to be very careful because this is a subjective um, analysis. Um, but so what I, what I see from what we have been talking about is that um, if, I take, if I take the, um, the idea that we're talking about a social, um, a social structure, that uh, the people who are not mentioned um, are not felt as a, a threat. They're, they're, they're sort of, um, we are aware that they are there, that, that women, uh, Sufi women exist somehow, um, but they're not, they're not considered as a, uh, something dangerous, they're sort of just not talked about. We know in uh, talking about my, my uh, research on Kelly Landimna, there are stories, funny stories about poor people uh, the, these poor people not not threatening. They're not revolutionary. So uh, was that something that was absent, or was it something that is voluntarily not talked about? Um, so that's that's very much a, a question that came up in my in my mind, and that we might like to think about. So, but otherwise, a fantastic workshop. Thank you so much. Changed my life. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. I'm, I'm reminded uh, when when you reminded us of of, of uh, trying to recapture things, the late Iraj Afshar in the last few years when I would see him would talk about the importance of local histories yeah. in, in, in Iran in particular, but in a wider sense. Um, trying to uncover what's going on locally and then assess and evaluate change uh, and the factors which went into that, which again is a possible vehicle for looking at the role of subalterns and such. Anybody else would like to come up and... Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, the mention of Iraj Afshar has reminded me, when I was doing field work in Iran, trudging around looking at every Qajar building, and there are a lot of them, there was, a, there was a, an institute that used to do these wonderful series, very intense, of local gazetteers. Iraj Afshar had inspired this, but various Iranian scholars had gone round various provinces. And after Iraj Afshar just went around by whatever means he could, and they looked at every monument that they could find. They recorded it, they made <coughs> notes on the dates of building, the dates of... These are still in very, very valuable sources. Mm -hmm. You've got them for Azerbaijan, Kerman, Isfahan, Shiraz, and I would certainly commend them. That was a great contribution that yep. that yep. wonderful man made. Yep. yep. Anyone else? <coughs> You're on the edge of your seat, no? It's falling off. <laughs> is that what it is? It's been a long day. Well, I appreciate everybody. Conferencing, uh, contrary to what people may think, uh, is uh, challenging and tiring work, uh, but it's also fun. Uh, you get to meet, as I say, a lot of familiar faces, meet some new faces as well to encourage especially the younger generation to come along. It's, it's lots of fun. Uh, this is why we do what we do, is because at the end of the day, it's, it's good fun. I've, I've quite enjoyed it. Uh, I'm a little older now, so I, have, I could say I've had many more years to enjoy it, to have enjoyed it than some of the other folks, but I'm sure you will do so uh, as well. And with that then, if nobody else has anything to say, I will bring the proceedings to a close, and eventually they will get mounted on YouTube and we'll be able to live, relive, and uh, oh my goodness, did I say that, sorts of moments and other cases as well. I'm sure there will be a few of those, but not too many. Okay. Thank you all very much. <laughs>